Welcome to the Journey Home program. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program, in which I've been given the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who, because of their great love for Jesus Christ, were brought home to the Catholic Church. We're speaking to you from the College Chapel at St. Patrick's Seminary, Maynooth, Ireland. And our guest in this episode from Ireland is John Gunn, from, originally from Dublin, Ireland, now living in, living in London. Hello, John. Hi, Marcus. Nice to meet you. Great to meet you. Uh, I'm going to get out of the way because you've got a lot to tell us and the normal place that I invite the guest to begin is to go way back and let us have a little glimpse of your early spiritual journey. Well, I suppose my spiritual journey began, you know, as every sort of Irish Catholic born into a Catholic family. I had very sort of devout um, Catholic grandparents. My grandmother had a great devotion to Our Lady. My grandfather had a great devotion to Our Lady. So I was sort of brought up in, a, in, in, in an atmosphere of love, Christianity, etc. Um, and kind of took it for granted. Um, my, my, you know, went through all the basics of communion, confirmation. But when I sort of hit my teens, there was changes happening in Ireland. Um, secularism, materialism, etc. was kicking in. And I kind of went down that road myself. Um, I always kind of thought of myself as Catholic. But in hindsight, looking back, I was a bit of a pick-and-mix Catholic, <laughs> so there was a number of teachings which I kind of glossed over and didn't really want to go there because the Lord loves me, doesn't he? So therefore I was able to sort of, in conscience, go along with it, keep my parents happy, so go through the motions of going to Mass. And then that, when I sort of left home and went, went abroad, I still went to Mass, but then it sort of slips away because when you, when you go overseas, you realise the gift that you have in Ireland where there's an abundance of churches and Mass and, and, and other Catholics. Part of the culture. Yeah. Here. You don't have that overseas. You actually have to fight to keep your faith overseas because the communities aren't as big, especially in England. So I kind of slipped away um, from the faith. This after you after you got out of the I, family? I, after, after I went abroad, slipped away. Um, I want to back up just a little bit there because uh, before you... When you look back on your formation as a child, um, if you look back on that, you, you were starting to pick and choose, which is probably maybe a little bit later when you were younger, going through catechism, confirmation, kind of yes. jumping through all the hoops. Was that for you a, a, more of an externalization of the faith than an internal acceptance of the faith, understanding the faith, or did you have good solid seeds planted in you as a child when you look back? I didn't really take them in. I kind of was on a conveyor belt like with a lot of other people. So as long as we went to Mass and, you know, went to confession, you know, and that was it really. Um, there wasn't a sort of living faith. Um, I didn't feel this living faith that I personally have got a responsibility to Christ yeah. as a soldier of Christ from when you're confirmed to go out and actually spread the good news mm -hmm. and live the faith and witness it in front of that other people. That was part of your understanding. Well, it was point. always other people's jobs, you know. <laughs> That's not my job. That's now when you brought up in, in Dublin, were you brought up in a, a part of it where you really were in a solid Catholic community or was there a more mixed community with non-Catholics? It was a Catholic community but uh, we were very quiet about our Catholicism, mm -hmm. the community. So maybe because everyone was Catholic, um, so things like apologetics, you didn't really go into apologetics. It wasn't really that important. There were organizations you could join, etc. But again, there seemed to be this watering down of, um, you know, the, the full faith was not sort of put in front of you for you to choose, for you to, to look at your relationship with Christ, the fact that we fall, we need to keep getting back up and following Christ's way, that the fact that the teaching magisterium is the Word of God, it's the living Word of God, so, and we, we've been given that by God to follow. So he wants us in heaven, follow the teaching magisterium. It's the ordinary means for Catholics to get to heaven. Um, at, that, at that time in your life, that was a, a, you know, far from an issue that you would have appreciated at the time. You said you started being a little bit of a, we use the phrase cafeteria Catholic. Yes. Did that develop real young or was that kind of a high school thing or when did... High school, I think really, you know, I, I was very much into playing rugby, martial arts. I was wondering, I looked like you played rugby. Yeah. I, had a feeling. <laughs> I went to a sort of a rugby school, uh, played a lot of rugby, real rugby culture. It was actually a Catholic school and, um, you know, they did teach us the faith, um, but it's, did we absorb it? Um, I didn't really see much witness from people around me. 
to sort of grab onto as mentors. Well, there's a guy three years old, I mean, he's living his faith, I want to be like him. There wasn't many of them around. Mm -hmm. um, so you can easily get sucked into kind of a watered down version. So as long as you're doing the basics, uh, the minimum stuff, oh, go to Mass on a Sunday, and then you kind of ask, well, am I doing that to keep my parents happy? Or am I doing it because I love Christ? And then when I'm going to Mass, am I actually disposed to receive the Blessed Sacrament? Do I even think about that? Am I fasting for the hour beforehand? All these questions, and if you look in the mirror, the answer is no. Um, can well, you I, probably weren't even raising those questions at that point. It wasn't probably. an issue. No, it wasn't even an issue. More interested in rugby, probably, at the time. More interested in rugby and, <laughs> and, and the lifestyle that goes with that, so you'd be more interested in your partying on a Saturday night. Um, mass on a Sunday would be a burden, but maybe because of your parents, you'd drag yourself out of bed <laughs> to go to Mass, and it, there would come times where you'd be late and you'd go into Mass and take a missile out of Mass to, to kind of prove you'd been there which actually hadn't. And, you know, you're sort of living a duplicitous life because you have holy grandparents, you've got reasonable parents, and you don't want to disappoint them. Right. And the problem is when you go away from home, yeah. uh, you don't have those sort of uh, that what, peer pressure. What took you away from home? You, you said you left the country, actually. Yes, well, basically in the, in the mid-80s, you know, Ireland materially wasn't doing too well. Mm -hmm. So you had to go overseas. To, I went to, to England to, to, get, to get work. You had accountants driving buses in Ireland. There just was a kind of a, a material sort of um, d depression. And a lot of my generation went overseas to America, to the UK. Now obviously Ireland has picked up, but the one thing that saddens me now, it's picked up materially, but spiritually, it's further uh, down the road away from Christ than it was 20 years ago. And that's sad. Um, uh, I suppose if you want to benchmark on how the faith is, when I went back to a recent school reunion, a number of my, my friends have lost the faith mm -hmm. because I'll ask them questions and by their answers, objectively, you say, well, you don't have the faith anymore, do you? And it's kind of, well, I'm too busy. Um, Are they at now where you probably would have been or where yeah. you were in the direction? Well, I, I was there as well, yeah. so having been on the other side, I know how they feel. It's this kind of, nothing's moving in your heart. Your heart is just, is, is cold. Um, you can absorb the information and you can go matter-of-factly, yes, sure, no problem. Oh, I, I kind of know that, but what's it got to do with me? Um, I'm a good guy. And I used to think I was a good guy. And all my friends think they're good guys. <laughs> and when you come back to the faith, you realize God is good. So how do you mark up to God? And if you mark up to God, then you're good. And if you don't, you know, you're a sinner who needs a savior. <laughs> well, I'm assuming that, that at that point when you're away from home, you said you were in places where uh, now you don't have the Catholic environment that mm -hmm. makes it easy to come yes. back and be involved. You're in a, you said you were in London, is yes. that where you had gone? So you're really more of an Anglican environment, though a yes. mixed environment because yes. there are evangelical churches and, yes. and uh, probably a high proportion of people that aren't churchgoers at all. So how was that effect on you, that time in London? Well, basically, in London, when you're working overseas, you really, and in hindsight again, you really have to fight to keep your faith. And I actually came across recently a, um, a CTS book, which was written, an Irish CTS book, was written for Irish people going to England about what they must be very careful to do certain things to keep their faith. Like, for instance, regular mass attendance, yeah. devotional life, etc. Try and put yourself into a group of like-minded people, you know, because mm -hmm. you'll always be pulled away um, to kind of water down and relax and not worry about it. And you could see the great concern that the Irish Catholics had for their, 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 their sons and daughters going overseas. And I've actually seen, you know, with a number of my friends who've gone overseas, how their faith has been watered down because it's the pull of the world. And yeah. you can always leave it for tomorrow. And yes, you have this kind of cultural Catholicism where maybe when you go back home, you'll go to mass to keep your mother happy. But actually, that's why you're doing it. You're not doing it out of love of Christ. And for me, um, England, because it was, it's so secular, it really is, yeah. to mention the word Jesus, you just can't do it. Mm. Well, I, I didn't do it. I do it a lot now. But before, <laughs> it was kind of, if you wanted to be acceptable, you couldn't really wear your Catholicism on your chest. Um, whereas once you know, one gets one's faith back, you realize you have to wear your Catholicism on the chest because how else are people going to know the truth? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, there was a famous phrase of St. Francis of Assisi said, evangelize always and sometimes use words. Now, living in England, it's slightly different to the United States because there's so much misinformation out there. 
I've sort of changed that to evangelize always and always use words. <laughs> so you can actually steer people to yeah. the Catholic Church as against just being Christian. You have to say, no, hold on a second, there is actually a true church, the, the, the Catholic Church. And then obviously you need to be sort of um, familiar with the apologetical arguments to back that up um, and then try and live your faith in front of people. So it's... I was going to say, sadly, many... Sadly, sometimes even missionaries uh, get caught up in the social action side of their missionary work. They're helping people feed themselves and learn how to take care of themselves better, and that's all good. Learn how to be productive, that's all good, but we've got to talk about it. You know, where did these things come from? Where's our abilities come from? You know, they've got to talk about so that these people that receive these gifts know that they're coming from Christ and His church. And if we don't talk about it, they can presume, well, they're just humans doing good human things. And sadly, like you said, in an environment especially that once was so strong in the faith and has drifted so far, now we gotta talk. We gotta talk, we gotta make people the disciples and that exactly. involves evangelization. How long then in your time in London uh, did, did this go on? And how far away from the church did you get? Oh, very far. I mean, I, I married, divorced, remarried. So, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty far from the church. When you went through the, the broken marriage, did it cross your, time that this, cross your mind that this is something I shouldn't be doing as a Catholic? Or is that so far out of your thinking by well, this time? Well, you know, it takes two. And, and yeah. to be fair, we didn't really bring God into, a, into our first marriage. We thought we did, but we actually didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so one got caught up into the materialism and all the problems that go. There was no God there. There was no sort of... The family that prays together stays together. There was none of that. And, and that's where my conscience, my convenient conscience kicked in. And I was able to bury certain things which didn't <laughs> suit me. And get on the sort of, on the treadmill of secularism and become ambitious. And I'm an accountant by profession. I started working in the funds industry, hedge funds, mm. lots of money, worked for very successful people, got into that sort of culture. And it's great, you know. Um, because you're driven, you're driven, you're achievers, you're, you're, you're working with achievers. That's all good stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of in that environment when um, I suppose having come through a, a marriage that, um, that had failed, that I, that I had a, a conscience, um, you know, uh, is this right or not? Um, and it was, it was basically, the Lord was calling me, but he's been calling me for all my life. <laughs> and then I realized sort of I've been sort of pushing the Lord back because it didn't suit because I wasn't prepared to convert, convert my heart, you know, yeah. because it means you have to and uh, make choices, uh, right. you have to make choices. And, you know, there's always tomorrow. So why not leave it till tomorrow? And, <laughs> you know, and, and I've come across a number of Catholics and, you know, their basic, um, the way they are living their life is I'll repent on my deathbed. Well, I just feel that the Lord won't be mocked. And praise God, the Lord's very merciful. But I personally could not risk my salvation mm -hmm. on such a selfish, uh, selfish sort of way, knowing that Christ has given me gifts now mm -hmm. to use for Christ. So he gives me gifts. I use them for him or I use them for myself. I used to use them for myself. Um, and I realize I get much more joy trying to use the gifts for Christ because he gives us all different gifts. Now, some people have the gifts of you know, uh, prayer, healing. I was given a big mouth. <laughs> so I could either use it for myself or for Christ. I find it's better to use it for Christ. And I think that's why he gave me a big mouth. He <laughs> gave us our, our, yes. our senses so we can use them for his glory. Um, so you had a your broken marriage, which yes. didn't have God in it. You said nope. you got remarried. It's still yes. outside the church at this yes. point. Right. Yes. Was there any faith in that marriage at first? <laughs> there was. Well, I, I actually got married in a registry office, and then we had a blessing in an Anglican church. So I, I did Because she was, your, your wife. My, was, my wife is Anglican. Yes. And... You know, so I was trying to kind of run with the horse and chase with the hound, you know, but the reality was I was out of God's grace. You know, hindsight showed me that. Mm -hmm. I had that internal, internal pull. Um, what sort of brought me very rapidly back to the faith was when I was working, I, I had um, a colleague who was from Islam. Uh, he was a Muslim, very devout Muslim. And one day he came into my office, because we used to talk, I, I like to talk and debate politics, etc. <laughs> he came into my office and presented me with a book on Islam. And I took it and, you know, it was only 20, 30 page book. He said, you should read this. And I said, yeah, I will read it. And so he was, on, he was actually uh, outgoing and bold enough with his faith that he was going to share it. Yes. Because his goal was to try and bring you into it. And he was very God. devout and he would do Ramadan, etc. Very devout, very sincere. Gave me the book. And I don't know, I just said, I'll take it. But will you read one of mine? And he went, sure. 
And then I said, well, I better find a book. So I was in London and uh, luckily enough around the... Uh, I used to go to the gym every day. I was very much into my fitness, etc. at the time, not anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm into spiritual fitness now. But um, I, there was a, just around the corner from the gym where I used to go to, there's a lovely church called um, in Farm Street in Berkeley Square in London, lovely Jesuit church. And I went into the back of that mm -hmm. church and they had little booklets, CTS, uh, Catholic Truth Society mm -hmm. books. And I went to pick one and I didn't go to pick the cheapest one, but the cheapest one was the Penny Catechism. <laughs> so I actually picked it up and says, That's still a penny? Or? Um, no, it was pound fifty. <laughs> but that was that was the cheapest. Uh, sorry, not the cheapest. That was I thought would give him the fundamentals yeah. of, of of Christian belief. So I picked up, but I actually read it again, and a lot of stuff started to. They were just clear answers to a lot of the issues in my life, <laughs> and it was kind of showing that I wasn't in a very good way. So I actually handed him the book. He handed the, his book to me, I read through it, and then uh, he was very sort of zealous, and he said, did you read the book? I said, yes, I did. Did you read mine? Oh, I'm getting around to it. Well, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll have a dialogue when you've read my book, because that's fair. Then he came back, we had a bit of a dialogue. So he actually did read it? He did read it, yeah. And then he came back with 20 questions for me. Mm. Ah, your faith says X, Y, and Z. And to be honest with you, I didn't know the answers. He was well read on his faith, I knew nothing. Uh, but I'm a great believer in technology, so I just went on the internet, tapped in Catholic, and up came Catholic Answers. So <laughs> I sort of went into the Catholic Answers website and literally answered his 20 questions very easily. And I actually found this is quite neat. You know, I, can, I, can, I don't have to be an expert. I can get the answers very quickly. I then came across EWTN, Ask an Expert. So I could go in there and sort of put questions. So I came back to him with the answers. Um, and then I said to him, I've actually got some questions for you. He didn't come back um, because I literally went out because I, I felt he, kind of he tried to sort of do a pincer movement on me <laughs> with pretty tough questions. So I said, well, I'll, I'll get 20 tough questions for him. I went around the internet, went on some very good apologetics websites and where, you know, if you're going to have your, your own fake question, that's fine yep. um, because it's either evidential based or not. Um, I threw a few questions back at himself. He didn't come back. So that kind of started me on my sort of journey home. Mm -hmm that there was this thing called truth. And I actually started, out of curiosity, started reading a lot of Catholic material that I never even knew existed. The Church Fathers, who were they? I never heard of the Church Fathers. When you read the Pentecatechism in, these, in the websites at that point, it wasn't convicting you at that point, but it was just information? It was interesting information and interesting information for a debate. It maybe even fed your pride a little bit in the it sense did. that I can, you know, I can uh, get the information and I can uh, come yeah. back with it. Yeah, yeah it did. It, yeah. It, there was a bit of vain glory there. Yeah. You know, this very smart um, Muslim was sort of trying to knock me out of my Catholicism. How dare he? <laughs> you know, my faith surely is a bit bigger than that. And I had all the answers. But then suddenly I realized, hold on a second, these answers are actually pretty clever answers. They're pretty sort of deep answers. So there I was kind of waking up. but. I was burying it because obviously the state I was in, you know, I, I was in a comfort zone. I was materially successful. I was in a, a very loving relationship, uh, which might have been in God's eyes the right way. But for me, you know, the, the Lord understands, doesn't he? You know, and you can convince yourself with these sort of things. So I was starting to kind of become more aware of my Catholicism and I actually did develop an interest in reading the stuff and and then Catechansis has a radio show and I used to listen to that mm -hmm. get onto EWTN suddenly there's all this information there's lots of information there yeah. so all you need to do is have a will to, to, to study it so I did I started studying it at my lunch breaks I started ordering as they say in Ireland shed loads of books tapes <laughs> Scott Hahn all the sort of great American apologists and, and I was devouring the stuff because I actually found it quite interesting mm -hmm. I then went, came back home to Ireland on a trip. I was very much into martial arts at the time. Mm. I came back with a friend uh, who was a policeman uh, and we were doing some training in Trinity College and we were going out on the, the beer, as they say in Ireland, um, after the training and we came back late to my father's house and we came in and it was all quiet. And I walked into the house of my friend and I, we had a kebab each. We were going to eat the kebab in the back room and we opened the door and my father was in the room in the dark on his knees. So I sort of looked around the door and went, sorry, Dad. Um, we went into the kitchen and my friend who's a policeman went, what's he doing? Because he's an agnostic Englishman. Yeah. What's he doing? I said, oh, he's probably praying. My father came into the kitchen about, uh, a few minutes later and my, my friend, the policeman, said, what were you doing? Um, I was praying. How long for? 
My father said, about two hours. And I nearly fell off the chair. Two hours? Why are you praying for two hours? He says, well, Our Lady of Fatima, I'm praying for the Pope, the Church, my family, my friends, sinners. It takes about two hours. Oh, right. And uh, my friend said, Fatima, what's that about? So my father then went and said, well, Our Lady appeared to Fatima. And I was very kind of dismissive. Oh, yeah, I know all that. Because I'd heard of Fatima. Mm. I thought I'd heard of Fatima. And um, he, I sort of was dismissive. But my friend was asking the questions. What, what happened at Fatima? Well, Our Lady appeared to three, three children. She revealed great prophecies. She called man, mankind back to Jesus, to conversion. And to back it up, she gave a great miracle. And I went, yeah, I know about that, the miracle of the sun. Well, my, my friend who's the policeman is very sceptical. What do you mean, miracle of the sun? What do you mean? Well, the sun danced in the sky in front of 70,000 people. And it was in the newspapers and there's witnesses. Now, my friend sort of uh, just looked strange, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't absorb it. And then my father told me about the other miracle of Fatima. And I was, oh, I didn't know about that one. What's that? This is when the atomic bomb blew up in Hiroshima. There was the eight Jesuit priests who were spared the bomb. Now, when I heard that, I kind of went, rubbish. That's absolute rubbish. There's no way that could happen. Um, so I went, when I got back to England, I started researching on the internet, and I found lots of references to it. Mm -hmm. But they're all Catholic references. So if you're a skeptic, you say, <laughs> they'd say that anyway. Rubbish. So I started searching and, and kind of forgot about it. And then a few weeks later, uh, I don't know, Curiosity Killed Cat, I did another search, a much wider search. And I came across this document written by the American Army. And what they'd done is they'd gone into Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the war, and they'd actually gone and, um, and sent teams in to write procedures of how do you cope with an atomic bomb. So I actually went in and uh, read these procedures, and smack bang in the middle of it was a testimony of a Jesuit priest who, had, who was outside Hiroshima he said he'd gone into the middle of Hiroshima with his, with his other colleagues. They, they created human chains to backload people out of Hiroshima into the, all the emergency tents. And smack bang in the middle of it, there was this reference to Father Schiffner and the Jesuits who were in the middle. So I was able to verify then they were actually alive. This was true. And that kind of hit me. Bang. This is true. Fatima's true. It's all becoming true. It's real. This isn't mm. superstitious mumbo jumbo. This is real. At the same time, a very close relative um, came down with uh, throat cancer, uh, very close to me and my wife. And we, um, she was agnostic. And then suddenly I realized, here's a poor soul who's going to die very soon, who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. And I had this kind of great sort of desire to, I've got to do something to try and get her into heaven. My father at the time gave me a book on the divine mercy. Mm. So I started praying the Divine Mercy for her. And we brought her home to our house. Uh, she was told she'd about four weeks to live. And I, and I was kind of walking on eggshells around my wife, who's <laughs> Anglican, etc. And it was, was quite hard to evangelize when you know, you know, you've got two different sort of perspectives on things. But this relative, um, I, was, I was left alone with her, as, as luck would have it, on Good Friday. It was Good Friday. Wow. And I was able to show her the picture of the Divine Mercy and bring the gospel to her. Um, and she smiled, she, she, she was in no pain or whatever. She died that night. Um, and I was called and I was able to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet over her as she died. That's really when I suppose I, could, I, um, wow. my, I was coming back to, I better start living my faith now. And it was only after the relative had passed on um, and we were waiting for the removals to come, I was flicking through the Divine Mercy book my father had given me and I'd flicked over a page and it said, um, let this be known from Christ, if you pray the Divine Mercy in the presence of the dying, I will stand before them as the God of mercy, not as the God of justice. That's when I decided I've got to be a practicing Catholic. Mm. So I um, had to go to confession uh, the next morning and I went to go to my local church. The church wasn't open, it was Easter, the priest was busy, the church up the road was closed as well. And at two parishes away, I, I, I caught the priest in. He said, yes, I'm having confessions in 15 minutes. I rushed down there and I walked into that church and straight over the altar was a massive picture of the Divine Mercy. So I kind of broke down and wept um, and said, right, I'm going to put it right. And then I had to put my relationship right with God, which I did. And I won't go into the details, but, you know, I had to put it right and I ended up getting properly married. Um, I went through a tri tribunal process and I left it to God. 
you know, I said, I'll follow whatever you decide I'll follow. My wife's been very supportive. We now have a lovely baby son. So oh. it's all worked out. It's interesting. Had your dad kept his faith all those years, but not uh, really to your knowledge? Or was his a rebirth of faith also? I think he'd always hung in there, but I think he'd kind of lapsed. But I think he always kept the prayer up. And that came from my grandmother. My grandmother had a great devotion to Our Lady. And I remember as, as she was old, she'd go into a room, she'd be on her own, she'd be playing what they call the blue rosary. And again, I was very dismissive of it, very dismissive. You know, yeah, she, this is old people's stuff. Then I realized I have great devotion to Our Lady now myself. But being given that chance, suddenly I realized the Lord's been good to me. Um, what am I doing for the Lord? And I was actually doing nothing for the Lord <laughs> at all. And he's given me talents, etc. Maybe I should start letting people know what I know because, um, you know, his mercy saves. But people need to know yeah. about his mercy and know that terms and conditions apply. And this is the problem nowadays is very few people will focus on the terms and conditions. Um, it's quite easy uh, to go out and proclaim half the gospel, yeah. but we have a full gospel. And as uh, Pope Paul VI said, we shouldn't blush the gospel because other people might be saved by other means, but will we be saved if we don't hmm. teach the full gospel? Um, you know, when Jesus, after being receiving the Holy Spirit coming uh, into him to confirm his mission there in the Jordan, uh, he went through the 40 days in the desert, a bit of testing time. And often that's what happens after. Mm. People come back to the faith. It's kind of like in the screw tape letters, you know, it's like, wait a second, what's going on here? You, just, mm. you, you know, the demon screwed up and now you got to bring him back. Um, but the one thing I, I thought about, you were a successful businessman, probably practicing like any of the other guys practicing there. Now you have this powerful conversion to Jesus. Boom. You know, what happened there? I mean, did it take well, a while for that to interact? Well, no, because, because of, the, I don't know the, the, what happened for me, I sort of very boldly took Christ into the workplace, <laughs> very boldly. Um, I was sort of buying bucket loads of Pillar of Fire, Pillar of Truth books from Catholic answers, <laughs> and literally I used to carry them around my pocket, and I would sort of introduce Christ to everyone as quickly as possible, <laughs> in a charitable way, but because I, I've been given a sort of a, maybe a, a bold character, I've no problem of saying this is how it is and a shoot from the hip style because it's the concern of Fatima. Many souls go to hell because no one prays for them. No one prays for them. Many souls go to hell. Now, if that's given to an eight and nine and 10 year old in 1917, and then you look at the state of the world today, there's an urgency. And this kind of, I suppose my style is, I can't wait for tomorrow. If the soul comes in front of me today, they better know about Jesus Christ today. I mightn't see them tomorrow. Yeah. And Christ on the last day will say to me, I sent this person to you. You didn't give him my word. Now, there's a comfort zone thing. And I did find when I'd um, sort of come back to the faith, you kind of learn there's the school of Knox to the mm. sort of how not to evangelize. And you know, you read books and I made a few mistakes out of my zealousness with my wife. I was too zealous, far too zealous. <laughs> and she's been very accommodating for me. Now, you know, we agree not to discuss it. <laughs> I pray for her. And, you know, I, I, I said I have great belief that people have to be sincere and follow what they truly believe. Yeah. Um, the only issue I ever have with our separated brethren is, you know, the big questions, are they actually attacking them and looking at them and researching them? Uh, when you read the early church fathers, that causes a lot of problems for a lot of non-Catholics. Because they haven't taken the time, you know, that the zealousness of, of your evangelistic zeal is, <clears throat> there are sadly too many who are uh, lifelong Catholics who will be put off by that. But I once had my staff do a little research and uh, my question was, how many people die every minute in the world? Okay, check that out. And while you're doing that, how many of those, what's the percentage of those that are Catholics? Okay, and they did that little research and it wasn't a thorough research project, it might be a little bit off, but they said about a hundred people die a minute in the world. That might be more mm. or less than that. But they estimate that about 70% of the world, 17% mm. of the world's population are Catholics. Okay, now let's be honest with, with one another. We look around at our brothers and sisters in the faith. Of those 17%, how many are really uh, truly convicted, practicing 
Catholics of that 17%. And I've looked at data and some scholars would say that maybe of that 17%, maybe four, five of those 17, which means that if every minute 100 people are dying and only four of those are actively convicted, knowledgeable, practicing Catholics, that's 96 people every minute are dying without knowing for sure that they're with Christ. We got a lot to do. <laughs> well, that's why. As I mean, I said, there's the conviction. I mean, that that's, yeah. that justifies the conviction of boldness. That there's probably not a one of us that doesn't need to be a little bolder. I mean, we can some always be more to be bolder. Be, pardon? We can always be more bolder. When you look back in the mirror, and I suppose maybe it's my career, etc. In business, you know, well, you can be quite ruthless to achieve your goals. Yeah. So, for instance, if you need to get the sales up 30 percent. After three months, you say, did we get the sales up? No. What didn't we do? Yeah. What do we need to do better? Well, you can take the same approach into, into the faith. You know, are you being a witness for Christ? Are you going out, standing for his truth, being unified under that truth, not separating unity from truth, realizing unity and truth are the same thing? So are you always putting forward the Catholic perspective in whatever you do, in business? Like, for instance, in ethics. I've been in business meetings now with the faith and a project will come and I'll say, I can't do that. And I'll say it boldly, I cannot be involved in that one. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I pray that you guys won't get involved in it either, because ethically it's wrong. It's simply wrong. Yeah. Now, that costs, but I do find my business colleagues who do understand, it, 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 it's sort of the Lord does kind of help you, but he will also challenge you. Um, one colleague, for instance, who I got, got very active in the pro-life movement, because I believe as a Catholic, you have no choice but to yeah. be involved in the pro-life movement because the innocents are being slaughtered and you need to mm -hmm. stand up for those innocents every possible way you can, obviously within the law. And uh, one of my friends who, who's non-Catholic, who has assisted, assisted sort of me uh, on my ministry, he, um, he couldn't really guess the kind of pro-life stance I had because he's sort of, he's one of the kind of mainstream well, I can, I'm, not a, I'm against abortion, but in the exer certain circumstances, the rape victim, etc. You know, and I've given him all the arguments uh, against that nonsense. But as luck would have it, uh, only a few months ago, he, uh, I go outside, uh, I'm in a pro-life group that goes outside abortion clinics, and I'll, I'll try and go you know, a couple of, couple of weekends a month. And, and witness and pray because to pray for those poor souls yeah, yeah. and the poor girls who you know they've been just put on a conveyor belt yeah. in society and they don't even know what they're doing most of them bless them but um, this friend of mine he one of his school friends he bumped into who hadn't seen in years and she actually was going outside the clinic I, I witnessed outside eight years ago and mm. she was turned around by a pavement uh, counselor and she's got a lovely eight-year-old daughter and suddenly my friend it's dawned on him this pro-life stuff isn't as mad. And the sad thing is, this, this, this daughter she had, she was a rape victim. Uh, yeah. And the penny drops yeah. and he's met this daughter and he goes, hmm, and he's moving more. And I pray for this chap and yeah. please God, he'll come. But he's certainly come, you know, that helped him a lot um, to sort of, to realize us pro-lifers, we're not so mad as you might think. We're just trying to protect life and from conception to natural death. And these are the big challenges that Catholics are facing this country, Today, Ireland. Especially. Why don't we take a break and we'll come back and that'll be one of the issues we can talk about when we come back. Stay with us, we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. Our guest in this special episode of The Journey Home from Ireland is John Gunn, who was born in Dublin but now living in, in London. Uh, during this last half of the program, uh, boy, there's so much that we could cover and uh, we need about four more hours. But I've got a couple topics I think it'd be good to touch on as we look back on your journey of the things that help strengthen your faith, yes. but also are the things that we need to be witnesses of to uh, those around us. 
And you mentioned the miracles, and uh, talk a bit about that, because some of our audience aren't familiar with those. The miracles of the Marian apparitions. Yes, well, for me, what was very important to come back to faith was, is this stuff true? Because if I'm going to change my life, it had better be true. Like, there's no point going on a very harsh diet if you're not going to lose weight. <laughs> so you'd research the diet and say, well, is this, is this the, the, the road I should take? So because of Fatima, I actually researched Fatima. I went out to Fatima. I actually met people really? who saw the miracle of Fatima. So I, I literally went in because I was changing my life. It has to be true for me. So when you research Fatima, and one of the, the sort of the big uh, revelations of Fatima was Our Lady showed the children hell. You know, the fires of hell, right. eternal hell fire. Now, this is something, why should you stop sinning? Because um, at, at worst, you want to avoid hell fire. At best, you love God and want to be with God forever. But if, it, if you're feeling a bit ropey in your life, you should say, well, hell exists. It's been revealed in miracles. Um, the miracle of Fatima, the sun dance in the sky, this can be verifiable. If you go onto the internet and just research it, it happened. Saint Jacinta, one of the three, her body was found incorrupt. That brings you on to the incorrupt saints. I've researched them. There's hundreds of them around the world. Their bodies haven't decomposed. Now, I have many agnostic friends and I give them this, this evidence and they just look at it and go, hmm, I say, but this is evidence. You have to remove this evidence out of your path if you want to believe what you want to believe because these miracles challenge your agnostic views or your atheist views because miracles can't happen if you're an atheist. When you go into Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe, you know, the, the Dilma is still there today. It's lasted 400 years. They've even shown, gone in and photographed it and found pictures in the eyeball of, of, of Our Lady Guadalupe. These miracles exist and they're there as a little signpost. Now, as has been revealed to those with faith, there's more than enough for those who believe. There's never enough for those who don't. <clears throat> but if you were doing an evidential-based approach to, to the faith and you had a jury and you put all the evidence up for Catholicism, the jury would find Catholicism true. Um, and what I find amazing with evidence is where you have people like um, uh, who are on death row, they can be sent to death with the witnesses of two people. So two people can condemn somebody to death on evidence. You look at the evidence of the Catholic Church, the early church fathers, four, five hundred years of the early Christian writings are all Catholic. The dogma is Catholic. It's not anything else but Catholic. You, you mentioned, that, let's go into the early church fathers because if you've listened to the Journey Home program at yes. all over the last eight years, that the early church fathers comes up over and over and over and over mm. again as such a major stepping stone for so many. W were they also important in your huge, own time? Huge, huge. Yeah. And, and I, I praise God for Catholic answers because yeah. never even heard of them <laughs> up till um, sort of, I actually then. That's my, interesting, as a Catholic, yes. bring them right up. So that points to the fact that sometimes, sadly, the average Catholic takes for granted yes. this great witness to our faith. It is, and the, the, the beauty of the Church Fathers is it gives you the continuity from Peter all the way through to Benedict mm -hmm. now. You, you actually see how the Catholic faith has always taught the same. It's developed some of the dogmas, but it's never contradicted itself. That very, was very key for me, because if it's true, it doesn't change. And if you go back and read the early Church Fathers, people like Polycarp, Ignatius of Antioch, you work all the way through um, to Augustine, all the way through, suddenly you've seen this unbroken line of teaching. And it's Catholic mm -hmm. all the way through. Purgatory, hell, the Eucharist, and the Eucharist is the key, the summit of our faith. It's there all the way through. And this is where you realize, this isn't just a bit of bread, this is actually the body of Christ. And then you realize the church is the living voice of Christ, and the Eucharist is Christ's actual presence in the church. And it's fantastic, but you have to research this. Now, I don't believe you have to be a theologian to be a Catholic. It's quite interesting, and I think uh, Christ, God has given us every Sunday to read up on the faith. So if you went through a, a, a lifetime of 80 years and spent each Sunday doing what you're supposed to do, which is meditate and read scripture, apologetics, church fathers, you'd suddenly realize why you love God, because the more you know God, the more you're going to love him. Uh, and it, the, the case is to point people in that direction, to point them to the good resources. You, were, you told me earlier, before we uh, got behind camera, about an example of your desire for truth, in yes. which you encountered something that, in fact, was a challenge to your faith. Yes, yes. Uh, that was a few years ago. Um, they found the ossuary of um, James, the brother of Jesus, and the son of uh, Joseph. Now, That's what it said on it. Yes. Yeah. And 
I sort of, um, because I'm into evidential, I believe there's a lot of evidence to back up our faith, mm -hmm. and that's the reason I'm Catholic. And if I, if, if I found out the Catholic faith was not the true faith, I would not be Catholic, I have to be honest, because I'm into truth. Now that was a challenge to the perpetual virginity of, of our Blessed Lady. And I said, right, I'm going to look at the evidence. And sadly, when I went and looked at the evidence uh, which was put up by our good apologists, I realised they were plausible. But it wasn't really sort of, um, this was pretty definitive. This was an oshery. It was traced back to first century Jerusalem. You know, it didn't look good for us, um, if one wants to be honest. Now, you can hold on to your faith anyway, but it was a serious attack on the you faith. You have to put that up on the shelf and ignore it. But if it's true... But you can't. Yeah. If you're into truth, you cannot set things aside. I've met too many Protestants who say, oh, set that aside. You can't. If it's true, it's true. You have to work with it and go through it. So obviously, um, I was quite saddened because I wanted to put this aside. I saw all this sort of the, the evidence. I saw some of the arguments. One of the arguments, for instance, was that Joseph could have been married before, widowed, and had other children. And I was kind of saying, yeah, well, that's not real. If I was on the jury, I wouldn't buy that. I'd kind of buy uh, the Osteries genuine. Uh, Christ did have brothers. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. You Catholics are wrong. Um, and then, praise God, the chap was discovered to be, uh, the ossuary was discovered to be a fake. <laughs> but it did rock me. Now, so therefore, you, you have to always be objectively looking at all the evidence and be objective in your analysis of evidence. So if you come across a hard saying in the Catholic faith or in the Bible, if you're a Protestant, you've got to work through it. Yeah. And you have to go to all the sources and you have to read all the sources. Sometimes you can say, you know, for now, I've not so much put it up on the shelf, but I recognize in my own humbleness. I, I don't know everything. So sometimes when one encounters something, um, well, I think it was Newman that said something about, remember the question about doubts, you know, um, the point is a million of these little chinks um, are still uh, assumptions. Yes. We've got to dig to um, the core of what it is we're encountering and trust in God's guidance. I mean, that's the key. And if we encounter something that's a challenge to our faith, we've got to be careful in allowing the other voices to use that to, to tear away at our faith, which is sadly where we live today with so many voices in the media, in our culture, that want to presume the opposite, chipping away at it. And that gets us to this issue of authority. I mean, yes. the early church fathers, uh, again, we're dealing with, with evidence, even in we're talking about miracles, we're dealing with the evidence of those miracles. When it comes down to it, when we have a discussion with an, a separated brethren about the meaning of baptism, the meaning of the Eucharist, pro-life issues, it all comes down to, in the end, which opinion are we going to decide which is true? And that gets us to the magisterium of Peter. How'd you work through that yourself? Well, to me, <laughs> it's the only thing that if Christ said he was truth, he'd be a bit mean on us to have just left us to our own devices. But he didn't. He says, I'm going to be with you till the end of time. He said, you are Peter. On this rock, I'll build my church. Kepha, big rock. Um, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. So you look at Peter, you analyze Peter, you realize this was the office, you know, Isaiah 22, 22, the keys, the office of prime minister. You know, that makes sense to me, because it's the only thing that does make sense. But then you actually look at the living church. How did the early church cope with this? And there's one of the, uh, I'm not too sure of which uh, f or early church father it is, but there was a dispute in the early church. And instead of deferring to John, who was still alive, they went back to Rome. Mm -hmm. And John was closer in Ephesus. But no, they went back to Rome. Oh, well, that would have been... Uh if I'm assuming you're talking about the letter of Clement, yes. who was writing to Corinth. Yes, that's right. Who could have written to Ephesus, Ephesus where John yeah. would have been, but exactly. instead he went to Clement went in Rome. To, to, to the office in Rome. And then you look back, looking, reading through all the, the lives of the popes, is that you realize, yes, yeah, some of them weren't impeccable without question. And that's a big blocking point, sadly, for a lot of people coming to our faith. But if you actually look at what they taught, while they were busy sinning, they weren't changing the doctrine. Yeah. And, and some of the dodgy popes, for instance, Alexander VI, yeah, he, d he didn't leave an impeccable life, but he didn't do anything that was contrary to faith and morals. He might not have lived up to it. So when you go through that authority, you realize that we have this kind of negative infallibility, that Christ will not actually allow the rock of Peter to preach error to the whole church. Now there was there was there has been heresies in the past and the church has come very close to crossing the mark, 
but you know, reading a lot of scholars who've, who've tried to debunk the church on its infallibility, a lot of them become Catholics yeah. because yeah. they realize the church That's has a powerful heard. witness when we read those stories. And it's negative yeah. infallibility. And I remember one of the apologists gave a very good sort of uh, description of negative infallibility. He said if you asked the Pope, who was, if the Pope was an expert in mathematics, and you asked him 200 questions on maths, how many would he get right? Now, most people will say all of them. The, tr the correct answer is he'll get right the ones he can answer. <laughs> so, therefore, there's some stuff that the Pope doesn't know yet. Right. Um, and he has to do his research and, and like roll up his sleeves like the rest of us and take counsel and pray about it. And then you look, for instance, for me, what was a real bedrock for my faith was Humana Vitae. Mm. There was a pronouncement by the Pope that went completely against the world and a lot of the people in the church. Yeah. And Pope Paul VI came out and bravely stated in his encyclical about the sanctity of life, he made prophecies about what would happen if you went against that and it's all coming true. Mm. And that to me is kind of what has reinforced my belief in the faith, that that was Peter doing what Peter should be doing, which is teaching the flock the truth. Yeah. And we have a responsibility to get behind Peter and follow Peter. So wherever Peter goes, we go. And when I mean Peter, I mean the teaching magister. Right. Right. So and Peter cannot... In union with, with the yes. seat of Peter. Yes, because Peter can't contradict himself. And that's one of the strengths of the church. We have the deposit of faith. So the Pope couldn't come out and say something that was contrary to what had always, all, always been taught. We would know, hold on a second, that goes against what the church has always taught. And, and the beauty of also that when you talk about Humana Vitae is um, those that don't like the teaching of Humana Vitae who will point at it as too hard. Kind of like when, when Jesus in John 6 said, this yes. is my body and my blood, and then a large group of the disciples said, this is hard teaching, and they bugged off. And we got sadly too many in the last 30 years that have done the same thing. But the beauty of Humana Vitae is God knows better than we do what's right for us and gives us the grace if we will respond in obedience. He gives us the grace to walk in the difficult way that he calls us to. He does. And for many people, the teachings of Humana Vitae can be difficult in certain situations, but God always knows better for us. Now, another issue I know that is hard for so many on mm. the journey the church is Our Lady. And you talked about the miracles and, and your little research there. But talk about Our Lady uh, in your own life. I mean, in, in a way, it was Our Lady that touched you through your mm. father, through the yes. praying of the rosary, yes. that kind of sparked your journey back. Well, I mean, Our Lady has one job, to bring us to Christ, you know. She is the mother of us all. And you go through, you know, from a great prayer, the Magnificat, you know, the Lord shows mercy to those who fear him. I mean, it's there, right from the, you know, her yes, save mankind. You know, Christ chose, God chose this meek, little, humble girl to be the salvation of us all. Because if she said no, I don't think, you know, God won't force his will on anyone. She said yes, and it was her yes that countered Eve's no, mm -hmm. which was able, she was the new covenant, to be able to bring the Saviour to us all. And, you know, for me, Mary's never really been an issue. Probably I've, I've witnessed it all through my life. So when I came back, yeah. the Mary side, I know it's a big deal for a lot of Protestants. Sure. Um, it's never been a big deal for me, but, uh, you know, the fourth commandment says, honor your father and mother. Jesus Christ wants his mother honored. He fulfilled the law. He wants his mother honored. We're we to should imitate honor her. Jesus. Yes. We're to imitate Jesus. We're to imitate Jesus, <laughs> honor his mother. The first miracle, Cana, was from the request of his mother. You know, she says, do whatever he tells you. We must do whatever he tells us. She has exalted, she is exalted by God. She is part of God's plan for our salvation. Now I know some people who don't understand Catholicism say, oh, we worship Mary. We don't, we honor her, we exalt her, we pray through her. I'd rather go and ask a mother to go to the Father and get a favor from me than go direct because I'm, I'm a sinner. If she comes in and asks, more likely to be listened to. So to me, it's never been an issue. The rosary is something which Fatima pray the rosary. Now, the interesting thing about the rosary, a lot of people have a problem with the rosary. But if it's a request at Fatima for us to pray the rosary, there's many other great prayers. Mm. But I always fit my rosaries in every day and yeah. my divine mercies. Then I can do all the other stuff. Well, when you think of uh, our, our, our late Holy Father, John Paul II, uh, brilliant man, scholar, theologian, leader of a bazillion. <laughs> and his deep commitment to the rosary. Yes.
I mean, that in itself should tell at least every Catholic that uh, as intellectual as he was, you know, that for him, his love for the rosary makes it something important for us to consider important. And speaking of John Paul, uh, you, you came back to the faith during yes. his pontificate. Yes. How important was he to your own journey well, of faith? I remember 1979 going to the Phoenix Park and seeing this uh, young Polish Pope come and fully, he was an evangelizer. He evangelized the whole world uh -huh. and he stood firm in the faith. He taught the truth. Wasn't very popular for teaching the truth, mm. but it's funny how all the world came to his funeral at the end. <laughs> and uh, who would you rather listen to, him or some of the other world leaders for guidance? I think I know who I'd go to. Mm. He also, part of his pontificate was he showed the value of life, the way he suffered. You know, one thing Christianity gives us that no other religion gives us is suffering, a reason for suffering. We see how the Pope suffered towards the end with dignity. So when everyone's attacking life, euthanasia, etc., there we have this great man who the world loved. And even the non-Catholics warmed to him because he was consistent. Yeah. He was consistent all the way through and he never compromised, never compromised. And, and there was no vanity that stopped him no. from, even when he had to suffer so yes. much towards the end, to hide himself away. No. Uh, uh, you certainly know your faith well, John. Our, other than being a businessman, are you actively involved in apologetic work? Um, I mean, you I, certainly know it well. <laughs> I do. I do a number of. Um, uh, num I'm involved in a number of groups in the United Kingdom. I tend to kind of be low key in that. Mm -hmm. I tend to do, you know, do do what I can do. But one right. always has to has to to walk the yeah. fine line, you know, do it for Christ, not for yourself. Right. So, I, I get involved behind the scenes in, in in a lot of things. But you're certainly a model of of learning your faith again. You learned it to a certain extent as a child, let it drift, but then now that you rediscover it, wow, you know, learn it all. If you're talking to folk that are, that are watching us, maybe especially Catholics who, that maybe they don't know their faith as well, they see the conviction that mm. they ought to be talking more, mm. they've got children and siblings and friends and relatives that uh, have taken the faith for granted. Any words of encouragement to them on being a witness for Christ even though they may not know the faith as well you do, what can they do to take little steps? Well, I'd say you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a theologian to be a Catholic. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you met a friend and said, watch EWTN, you've evangelized <laughs> because they're giving the people like Marcus Grote who do know the faith. <laughs> so all you have to do is point them in the right direction. One thing I learned when I did martial arts is when I used to train white belts, I didn't have to be the grand master. I just know a little bit more than the white belt. <laughs> so you can actually pass people up the chain. You can say, go to www.ewtn.com. You'll find the truth. You can hand out simple booklets like the Penny Catechism. They cost you one pound fifty from Catholic Truth Society. You can hand this out. You don't have to be an expert. Pray about it. However, the Lord has given you a Sunday. And if you can read, you should actually, um, you know, study your faith. Another thing we sadly take for granted is prayer. I mean, you certainly mentioned that, but since conversion comes about by grace, mm. then isn't the most important thing we can do for other people is actively prayer. Pray always. Um, I, for instance, wear a rosy ring, so I'm forever praying <laughs> um, because I have to pray for my own salvation and the salvation of others. So when you meet people, I always question myself at the end of the day, have I prayed enough for people? You know, I'm going out evangelizing and saying Jesus Christ matters in your life, but am I praying and making sacrifices, the call of Fatima, things like fasting, fast, give up things, offer it up, the old mm. things. You see here this when I was a kid, offer it up, what's that mean? Offer it up <laughs> for other people and yourself, because if you want to save your own soul, try and save a few others. Mm. That's the way I, I would Something say Something else I think about as we're here in Ireland is that in the United States, technically, in any town, all the churches are about as old as another. You know, the yes. oldest Catholic church is any very little as old as the oldest Protestant church. Mm. You come here in Ireland, and there is a thousand-year-old church or a 1,500-year-old ruins from a monastery not far from here. Or as John, you and I are sitting in this Amazing. absolutely magnificent. Mm. But isn't it true that many Irish Catholics take for granted what's right in front of their faces to get out and look at the great depth of our faith? That's all around us here. That is one of the sad problems, and, and what people need is more witnesses out there standing up for Christ in the workplace, on the street, in the sports club. Stand up for Christ. And as John Paul II said, you know, 
courage, courage, courage. Be not afraid. Do not be afraid. Now, you, you might, when you come back on a journey home, you might lose a few friends, but you certainly gain lots of others. Mm. And it's a case of be faithful to Christ. All we're asked for from Christ is to be faithful, not results. He's not results-based. He's faithfulness-based. We leave those to him. We leave those to him. In, in the UK, we have the great Mars St. Thomas More. What did he achieve? Probably nothing. If you're a businessman, you'd say, well, <laughs> he should have gone with the flow. But no, he witnessed for the truth. So the truth does matter. We have the blood of the martyrs. Now, we don't get called to give our blood nowadays. It might happen in the future. John Paul II said it probably will. So at the moment, we might become social martyrs, but we certainly won't have to shed our blood. So therefore, we should use the gifts we've been given for the greater honour and glory of God, because at the end of the day, that's who we're going to meet at the end of our journey home, at the end of our lives. John, it's been great visiting Marcus. with you. Thank you so much. In fact, I'm excited to, to hear you say that part of your journey was EWTN, and we're glad that we were able to be an encouragement to you on your own journey, and thank you for that little plug to encourage those that are here uh, as a way of not only growing in their own faith, but as a way of reaching out to their friends and pointing them. Well, I guess not just EWTN, but to all the resources mm. that God has given us to help us remind us of the beauty of our faith. So thank you very much, John. Thank you for joining us on these special episodes from Ireland. I hope they've been an encouragement to you. God bless. I'll see you again next time.